mindset of who God is and how God gives us the, the mind of how we ought to have unity and diversity. Because from the beginning, God has made it very clear who he is and he made us in his image and likeness. And if he made us in his image and likeness, then we ought to strive to be like him. So I just wanna make that the tone by which we set the discussion. I'm gonna share my screen with a PowerPoint that I prepared for tonight. Um, and if you guys have any questions at all, this, some of the topics that I'm, some of the things that I'm gonna be saying tonight are a little bit theological in nature. Um, we are gonna be talking about the Trinity um, and I don't want you guys to get discouraged from stopping me, interrupting, um, because the Trinity is the model for unity and diversity. The Trinity is the model, I'm going to repeat that, is the model for unity and diversity, and the Trinity is what shapes our understanding of it. But before we get into that, let's get into um, a little bit of some wisdom from the early church. So, Something that I, I, I want you guys to think about is it teaching is reliable, and this is from St. Clement, when the hearer's faith, a sort of natural art, contributes to the process of learning. For even the very best instruction isn't any good without a receptive learner. So meaning, if I'm just sitting here talking at you, it's not going to do anyone any good unless we sort of really tune in, really dial in, shut off whatever distractions are going on around you. If you are out, you know, I know it's going to be difficult to, to really focus, but, you know, if you just pick little pieces of this discussion, you might miss the whole point of it. So I really encourage you guys to like put your phone on do not disturb um, because you have to be contributing to the process of, of learning. So that's just some wisdom from the early church. It's easy to measure the entire sea with a tiny cup than to grasp God's ineffable, ineffable greatness with the human mind. So St. Basil and St. Clement, you know, give us, drop some bombs for us and uh, allow us to really just get into the mindset of this discussion. And Archbishop Callistus Ware also shares something really nice here. He says, it's impossible for me to believe that someone or something exists and yet for this belief to have no practical effect on my life. I can open the telephone directory for Wigan and scan the names recorded on its pages. And as I read, I'm prepared to believe that some or these people actually exist, but I know none of them personally. I've never even visited Wigan. And so my belief that they exist makes no particular difference to me. What is Archbishop, Anthony, uh, Archbishop Callistus Ware saying here? He's saying that faith in God isn't just head knowledge. It is about an experience and about an actual getting to know someone personally. So the goal of this discussion is not for me to give you guys some things to just know, but to actually encourage you to encounter the divine more. Encourage you to strive to dig deeper and to press into your relationship with God. Because it, nowadays, we have gotten away from the mind of God and gotten, gotten more into this idea of what moves my heart what directs me according to what feels right or feels good. And a lot of the social movements that are happening now are really great, but the, the mindset behind them aren't the heart and the mind of God. And I'm not referring to any particular movement. I don't, I don't I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear about that. What I'm trying to say is that when we move without God, the heart is deceitful above all things. But when we have the heart and the mind of God, God directs us, the Holy Spirit encourages us, and he pushes us in the direction to have true unity and diversity. And that's a subject of discussion today. But I wanted to just lead this conversation just with those thoughts to start. So, but the key thing in order for us to really dig into this conversation is to really believe that we are capable of changing our mind. And that's what metanoia means. That's what metanoia or repentance means. It's a change of mind, the change of direction. So in approaching God, we are to change our mind, stripping ourselves of our habitual ways of thinking. We are not, on, we are not to be converted not only in our will, but in our intellect. So there has to be a change of mind that happens in this conversation. And that's my goal. It's not for me to be doing that, but for God, again, to if there's something within that has been working in this conversation or some presuppositions that have sort of been embedded that you're willing to change your mind. Fair? So those are just some caveats in the conversation. So why is this important? Again, because we have these presupposed ideas about who God is and these presupposed ideas about who we are, right? 
So, and who, who, who each other are. So oftentimes we have ideas about certain people or certain things or God, but we don't really know the person or experience the person unless we have a close proximity. You know what I mean by that? So like somebody who, I heard this actually today and I thought it was really cool. Somebody who cares about police officers usually has a close relationship with somebody who is a police officer. Somebody who cares about a specific movement or cause usually has a close proximity to that person. So when we have presupposed ideas about each other, a lot of times it's due to not having proximity, not having a closeness. Mina can say something really offensive to me, and because I know him, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. But when I don't have close proximity to you, I presuppose, I have these ideas, and that's where a lot of times we have these disoriented ideas about who God is and these disoriented ideas about who we are, each other are. And that actually is part of what Mina, Mina, Mina discussed earlier, the podcast that we launched. It's all about the misconceptions that we have about God. So God, are you judgmental? God, do you, uh, are, are, are you racist? Do you care about racism? Is your church racist? There's a bunch of discussions there, and I encourage you guys to check it out on your various platforms. Um, but we have these presupposed ideas about each other. And our world, to be honest, guys, is this, right? Based on our presupposed ideas. You, you, you're this. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're left. Oh, you're blue. Oh, you're, it, there's just a lot of finger pointing. We have so many Facebook warriors and Instagram warriors and people commenting. And there's just so much division and so much anger and so much bitterness and so many people that are constantly trying to point the finger at one another. Right. And I heard something really cool. They said that recently they said, instead of pointing fingers, start pointing thumbs. Right. Instead of looking at each other, pointing fingers, point the finger at yourself, which is your thumb. Look within and see where there are things that need to change. So our world is actually, to be honest, broken. And it's broken right now more than ever because everybody is pointing the finger at one another. And there is this lack of unity. There's this lack of oneness. There's this lack of willingness to give each other the benefit of the doubt. There's a lack of desire to really give the person, and, and a lot of times also due to lack of proximity. Right now with COVID, we have very far proximity from each other, six feet distance. But in even more, it's, it's, it's brought about a lot of the things that people are angry about. And we're not willing to give each other a little bit of the space to disagree or to agree. So our world is suffering. And I'm going to share something really interesting to you. When I, when I say our world is suffering, I mean literally our world is suffering. Because the word suffering in, in Hebrew means disunity, discord, lack of oneness. Like we are literally ripped apart. And when we are ripped apart, we're not whole. We're not able to be the fullness of who God wants us to be. Now, again, I just want to encourage you guys. These are just some, some framework for the conversation. So what is the role of Christians? The role of Christians is what Christ prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, right before this whole pandemic started, I got the blessing of going to Israel and I actually visited the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was really cool to see where the olive branches are and where the last prayer was prayed. And I'm thinking to myself, like in this exact place where the Garden of Gethsemane is, all around proximity is so much division. Like whether it be Pal Palestinians and Israelis, whether it be Muslims and Jews and Christians, so much division, so much disunity. And this is the exact place where Christ prayed this prayer in John chapter 17. He says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. In our oneness, people believe in Christ. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. We are made perfect when we're one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Why is this the last prayer that Christ is praying? Like, surely you would say, 
there's probably a million other prayers. I mean, if you go to John chapter 16, 17, you know, there's a variety of things that Christ is praying. But why does he pray this as one of his last prayers? Is because it's to instill in us this idea of oneness, this idea of unity, this idea of, 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 of being connected to each other. So why am I talking about this? The key point of this discussion is as a Christian, my goal is to have unity with my brother or sister without consuming their uniqueness and without diluting myself. What do I mean by that? Heavy words, but I want to I want to repeat it. My goal as a Christian is to have unity with my brother and sister without consuming their uniqueness. So I can't force them to be me. If we are sometimes we think unity is sameness. It's exact, like, you are to be a carbon copy of me. You are to think like me, you are to talk like me, you are to act like me. But that's actually not what unity is. You're not supposed to consume the uniqueness of the person in front of you. You're supposed to respect the diversity that God has given that person. Mina and I don't look alike. We're very different. His gifts are different than my gifts. So I, I'm, I'm to respect his uniqueness. But at the same time, I'm not to dilute myself, meaning... I'm not to reduce who I am for the, uh, for the sake of wanting to, like, for, I'll give you an example. If my beliefs are being compromised, right, because somebody's saying, have unity with me, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't have unity with you if you're, if you're forcing me to compromise who I am and what I believe, because my beliefs are based on who God is. So, again, without consuming their uniqueness and without diluting myself. I shouldn't have to reduce myself for you to accept me and to have oneness with me. Do you understand what I mean by that? Any questions on that? Because this is modeled in God himself. And let me explain why. In essence, it's unity without uniformity and diversity without fragmentation. Heavy words, lots of things, but we'll skip that for now. Unity without uniformity, so we don't have to all be the same, and diversity without being divided. Fair? So, in order for us to understand how we can have unity and diversity, we got we to gotta tackle this subject of personhood, right? And per personhood in orthodoxy has a lot of importance, right? Because we say that God is three distinct persons. Trinity is three distinct persons, right? And we say that we, are, we ought to be persons. But society has gotten into this idea of you are an individual, do you. And an individual is an individual, in one who is divided, one who is unable to share himself. Aristotle defined it as one who is an idiot and unable to share himself or interact with his environment. So an individual is one saying that I'm dividing myself from you. But a person, a prosopon, is one who is able to share himself with others and interact with his or her environment. So the goal is for us, and I know we don't think about these in theological terms. Like when I say I'm an individual, I'm not thinking about it. Oh, I'm not going to share myself. But language sometimes sets the framework for how we think, right? So what you say is oftentimes based on what you think and what you perceive about a certain situation. So I, I really love this quote. It's from Archbishop Callistus Ware. And a lot of these quotes is from the book, The Orthodox Way. I highly encourage you to read it. Um, and he says, a person is not the same as an individual. Isolated, self-dependent, none of us is an authentic person, but merely an individual, a bare unit as recorded in the, sense, in the census. Egocentricity is the death of true personhood. Each becomes a real person only through entering into relation with other persons, through living for them and in them. I'm going to summarize this quote for in a second. In COVID, we have learned this lesson very crystal clear. Being isolated from other people, it's taught us the reality of how much we need other people. It's taught us the reality of how we only are able to be the fullness of who we are when we have people to interact with and having relationship with living in them and for them and through them right? Not being able to see your friends at church, not being able to connect with others has really taught us the value of community and relationships, right? We're not meant to live alone. We're not meant to be by ourselves. 
we're not meant to be divided and you know self-centered ego egocentric people we're meant to be interacting with one another connecting with one another so here's the here's the crux of it and i'm, I'm wrapping up shortly i don't want to talk for too much but archbishop Callistus where where explains this whole thing in the concept of the trinity you, you in, in the not the concept of the, 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 the trinity the reality of the trinity Man, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, this is a lot of text, so I want you guys just to really read it with me. Man is made not only in the image of God, but more specifically in the image of God, the Trinity. So we're made not only into the image of God, but we're made in the image of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Let us make man in our image and likeness, Genesis 126, right? Since the image of God in man is a Trinitarian image, it follows that man, like God, realizes his true nature through mutual life this whole idea of sharing life the image signifies relation relationship not only with god but with other men just as the three divine persons live in and for each other so man being made in the trinitarian image becomes a real person by seeing the world through others eyes by making others joys and sorrows his own each human being is unique, yet each in uniqueness is created for communion with others. Heavy quote, saying that we are modeled after the Trinity, and because we are modeled after the Trinity, the Trinity is a circle, right? Father shares his love with the, with the Son, Son shares his love with the Holy Spirit, and the relationship is reciprocal, right? And we are to be the same. We're to, we only become real persons by seeing the world through others' joys, through others' sorrows, through others' hurts, through others' pain. We, each human being is unique, right? And in sharing in that uniqueness and connecting with each other and being with each other, we model the Trinity. And I'm gonna get into this deeper first, even more in a second. So how is this modeled? There is eternally in God true unity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, unity, right? With, but there is combined with gen, genuine personal differentiation. What do I mean by that? The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, right? We can't say that they are the same. They're, they're three distinct persons, right? There, there's genuine personal differentiation. The term essence or substance indicates the unity. They share the same fabric. They share the same Godhead. And the term person indicates a differentiation. That's why we say in the creed, and this is heavy stuff, but don't worry, I'm going to move forward through this fast. But I want you guys to really grasp this. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three distinct persons sharing the same essence, the same fabric. Mina, Chris, Mina, Yusuf, three distinct persons sharing the same humanity, the same fabric. However, there's a difference between Mina, Chris, and Mina, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The difference is we don't share the same will. You understand what I mean by that? Me and Mina, we have completely, the, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they work, the will is solved, the salvation of man, the direction that they're working together is full cooperation with one another. That's supposed to be modeled in us. It's supposed to be modeled in us. However, we don't even really understand the Trinity to understand how we ought to be. And again, this is a lot of heavy stuff, but it's, it's, it's important that we read this very carefully. In the case of three persons of the Trinity, there is distinction, but never separation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so the saints affirm following the testimony of Scripture, have only one will and not three only one essence and not three none of the three ever acts separately apart from the other two there are not three gods but one god one more time they have only one will not three mina chris and mina we have three different wills they have only one essence and not three None of the three ever act separately apart from the other two. There are not three gods, but one God. 
So can yeah. I just ask, can I ask a question here? Sure. So, so are you saying, or just to clarify, like if we were in perfect harmony, we would all have the same will or for each other at least, or for myself, like, can you clarify that? Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So if we were in, if we were to model the Trinity, we would all have the same direction. It would look differently. We would have unity, but we'd be diverse, right? We would have this desire to, we would all look very different from each other, right? Which we do. We'd all have very different gifts, which we do. But we'd have the same direction and will. And that's how the church, the body of Christ, ought to be, is that we have a diversity. We being many are one body, but individually members of one another, right? That's what the book of Romans says. We're individually members of one another. And this is embedded all over the church. The Trinitarian doctrine of God in diversity, unity and diversity, is, is literally embedded everywhere in our liturgical services. And I'll get into that in a second. But I don't want, I, I don't want you guys to get lost in this, in this theological stuff. But I think it's important for you to say, okay, we're, unity and diversity right now is like a catchphrase. It's like cute. People like to say, let's have unity and diversity. We're all different, but let's like be the same. Like, no, we are all different. And, and, but, but our direction needs to be the same, meaning that we all need to be working. We don't need to see eye to eye in all things, but we need to be walking hand in hand. And I'll, I'll, I'll dig deeper into that in a second. And again, the language that we use, by the way, could be totally flawed, right? Like if I said something now that confused you, it's because human language is limited to describe the Godhead, right? So do not be surprised that we speak of the Godhead as being at the same time both unified and differentiating, differentiated, using riddles as it were envisage, envisage a strange and paradoxical diversity and unity and unity and diversity. I can't even, I can't even pronounce the word envisage. Is that even how you pronounce it? St. Gregory of Nyssa is speaking language, you know, words that I don't even know how to pronounce. So what is he saying here, St. Gregory? He's saying that the language that we use is limited, right? But the, the concept is God is three distinct persons sharing one essence and sharing one will, right? And that is he created us in his image and likeness. And we need to, need to be distinct persons sharing the same will in the same direction. Now, that seems nearly impossible. And that seems nearly impossible because of the broken world that we live in. That the broken world that we live in has divided us. It's made us literally people that are divided, people that are suffering, people that are broken. We can't see eye to eye. We struggle to, to give the person the benefit of the doubt in front of us. We struggle with even being able to like, when somebody says like, hey, black lives matter, hypothetically, they're like, wait, no, all lives matter. Blue lives matter. There's just no space anymore in our society to be able, even to, able to have dialogue. Nobody's willing to give, have conversations and give the person the benefit of the doubt and listen to where they're coming from. Because again, the proximity that that person has to the person that they're advocating for is shaping their worldview, is shaping the thing that they're passionate about, is shaping the thing that they're mostly moved by. So again, don't be surprised when we speak about the Godhead and its confusing language. So why is this stuff, this theological stuff so important? Again, Callistus Ware's, his language is fantastic here. He says, a genuine, genuine confession of faith in the triune God can be made only by those who, after the likeness of the Trinity, show love mutually towards each other. There is an integral connection between our love for one another and our faith in the Trinity. There is an integral connection between our love for one another and our faith in the Trinity. The first is a precondition for the second. Notice it doesn't say love the Trinity and then love each other. The first is a precondition for the second. In order to love your brother, you, in order to love God, you have to love your brother first. And in turn, the second gives full strength and meaning to the first. Does that make sense? So. Chris, can you, you mind if we just pause here and just ask if there's any questions? Just yeah, yeah, let's do it. Thank Terry, you. 
It does a lot of, I know. I told you. I told you it's going to be heavy. No, it's great. Honestly, it's actually fantastic. It's just uh, I want to give. Does anybody have a question at all? Anton, I see your hand up. Do you have a specific question? Uh, uh, I just wanted to to clarify um, Chris's point. I just wanted to understand if I understand what he's trying to say uh, very clearly. So, the Trinity they all have uh, the same will, uh, and but each one is a different is a different person. Uh, and we're supposed to have the same same concept. We're supposed to be of the same will, but each one is a different person. Like everyone is supposed to act differently, but we all are united in having one uh, one goal. Is that is that what you're trying to Correct. say, Chris? I'm Correct. just trying to understand. Correct. That. Correct. Because it's kind of what you're saying is very deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, I'm just it, trying it, to it, get there. So, yeah. It's your you, and Antonio. You said it exactly right. It's, it's exactly that concept. That's exactly it. Is that we're, we model the Trinity and if the Trinity, but the key thing in the Trinity is the, is the relationship of love that the father has for the son and the son has for the Holy Spirit and then vice versa, the Holy Spirit for the son. So that love that the Holy Trinity shares is what shapes the unity and diversity. That's a key point that I missed earlier is that the love, they, they call it this, this, this relationship of love, the circle of love that the Holy Trinity has with each other, that, that shapes the, the whole, the whole, um, the whole framework of the relationship. Do you know what I mean? Like I can't have unity with you and I, and, and still have my diversity if I don't love you and you don't love me. But same back to that concept of proximity, right? If I love you, I'm, I have unity with you, even though you're very different than me. I see what you're trying to say. It just, it's, it sounds infeasible. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, let me, let not... me, let me, let me show you something even cooler. Let me show you something really cool here. So God has painted this even in our environment. By the way, guys, environmentalism isn't a liberal, uh, you know, thing that, you know, just, came up actually orthodox christians were the first environmentalists and uh, you they're actually the ecumenical patriarch of the eastern orthodox church they call him the green patriarch because he actually has written books about how man is to tend and keep the environment and to protect it and to bring the environment to worship god but I, I'm, that's a, a, a side note we can talk about that later on another another conversation but God has embedded this mystery of our need for one another and this unity and our, that we, like, we cannot be the fullness of who we are. We can't be that person unless we have each other. I can't be the fullness of who God created me to be without you and you, because I only learn who I am by having a relationship with you. I only learn that I'm funny when I have somebody to tell jokes to. I only learn that I can give a talk if I have an audience to talk to, unless I'm talking to myself and people think I'm schizophrenic, right? They, you only learn, you only develop your personhood when you have a person to interact with. So that's why we need each other. And God has made that very clear. And he's embedded this idea of unity and diversity, even in the environment. I'm going to share a video with you guys real quick right now. And let me know if you guys have any trouble hearing this. Chris? Can I, Chris, can I say something? Sure, Uncle Sumi, please. Sorry, Malish. Uh, I don't know if the sound is clear. Or la -la -a. But this idea is very fundamental, and I agree with you in everything you're saying. And St. Paul speaks about this very clearly in 1 Corinthians 12, the idea of different members with different functions, but yet one body. So maybe yeah, I understand what you want to say about the triune God and how we can relate to but also the example of the one body and, and different members is also uh, maybe can clarify what you want to say a little yeah. bit more in, yeah, a, in, a, in an easier way yeah no I, I totally agree with that I think Al-Kasimir is right there is uh, you know did, it, did you hear me guys yes yes we heard you okay. Nina, you heard him? thank you yeah, yeah. Yes, no, Al Samir is 100% right. He, he's talking about the passage in 1 Corinthians where it says that there is diversity. There, but we being many are one body and there's some who are made preachers, some who are made evangelists, some who are made, you know, this and that, each for the benefit and edification of the body of Christ. So there's diversity of gifts, but a same goal, a same vision, a same direction. 
And I, I only um, am sharing about the Trinity because we don't talk about the Trinity as often. And I think when we pray, we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we should know the Trinity, even right. though the concept is very challenging to understand. Um, and that's why St. Gregory, I said, it's, it's like a paradoxical riddle when we talk about the Trinity. Also, to your point, Chris, if this is unit, like, this is perfected unity, right? So yeah. if you're ever seeking unity, you look towards perfection, right? And you look towards the model. I think yeah. that's what's really cool about how you're describing this because it is the essence of perfection. And if we can understand that and relate it back to ourselves, then, you know, we can get steps ahead of this. Exactly. And that's exactly the point is that if God created us in his image and likeness, then he's not setting us up for something that's impossible. Again, Anton says it seems indescribable, incapable for us doing it. And we have so much division, but just because our nature is fallen, doesn't mean that God didn't equip us if we all strive and draw near to him with the ability to do so. And we see unity and diversity in families. Maybe we don't see it amongst mass quantities of people, but we see unity and diverse in diversity amongst priests. We see unity and diversity. It's all over, you know, our world. So, the, you know, the goal is the harmony of the whole church coming together and each of us coming together. But if I have this mindset of, I am to have unity with my brother, even though my brother is different, then I give that my, my brother the space to be different. And I'll get to that in a second, We're wrapping up in a few minutes. This is a cool video. And I learned about the environment, uh, having, you know, you know, the trees speak to each other. Trees actually have relationships with one another. They warn each other. And it's this idea of basically God embedding, like, you know how when we pray in Tazbeha, we say, oh, stars moon plants trees mountains how do how does nature worship god is because it worships god when it's doing what it's supposed to do and living for the glory of god and god has shaped the world with little mysteries with little things that point us back to him so this is a cool video that i think you guys will enjoy it's a trees may look like solitary individuals but the ground beneath our feet tells a different story. Trees yeah, it's fine. are simply talking, trading, and waging war on one another. They do this using a network of fungi that grow around and inside their roots. The fungi provide the trees with nutrients, and in return, they receive sugars. But scientists have found this connection runs far deeper than first thought. By plugging into the fungal network, trees can share resources with each other. The system has been nicknamed the Wood Wide Web. It's thought that older trees, fondly known as mother trees, use this fungal network to supply shaded seedlings with sugars, giving them a better chance of survival. Those trees that are sick or dying may dump their resources into the network, which might then be used by healthier neighbours. Plants also use fungi to send messages to one another. If they're attacked, they can release chemical signals through their roots, which can warn their neighbors to raise their defenses. But like our internet, the wood wide web has its dark side too. Some orchids hack the system to steal resources from nearby trees. And other species, like the black walnut, spread toxic chemicals through the network to sabotage their rivals. Arboreal cybercrime aside, scientists are still debating why plants seem to behave in such an altruistic way. The hidden network creates a thriving community between individuals. When you're next in Woodland, you might like to think of trees as part of a big super organism, chatting and swapping information and food under your feet. So why, why am I talking about environment and trees and all these different things? I'm not just here to bore you, it's just to tell you and to show you that this idea of connectedness, this idea of trees sharing resources one with one another, you know, in giving, you know, when one branch of a tree dies, actually that tree that di dies gives life to a whole number of other trees. So this idea that we are connected, this idea of this unity and diversity is really embedded even in the environment that God has stamped this everywhere we look. And that's why nature is such a, a great place to look for God's Hand, handmanship, his work, his artwork, all over, all over the environment, you'll see things that are pointing us back to the mystery of God. Another thing that our church does is it teaches us about this Eucharist, right? 
the, the fundamental pinnacle of our faith is the Eucharist. A lot of us haven't been able to take communion in a long period of time, right? Romans 12, 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. When the church is offering its love, it's the image and likeness of the Trinity. When the, we take one loaf, one bread, the, this bread becomes the true body and true blood of Christ. And this true body and true blood of Christ is broken one amongst many. And we are all receiving the same loaf, that none of us are higher or lower, better or worse. All of us are sinners before the table of God. And he still gives us this gift to remind us that nobody is above the other. Even in the kiss of peace, the church, in the early church, the kiss of peace was, was actually a kiss. It wasn't like a, like, they only made it a this when they, uh, when they didn't want men and women to be kissing each other. It was for like, for protection actually. Um, so it was a sign of fidelity, right? When somebody would walk in the street and they would kiss one another, it was a sign that we shared, we shared the same like breath, the same pneuma. And in the church, they brought this kiss of peace in to say that whether you are rich or poor, whether you're black or white, whether you're tall or short, you share the same breath, you share, you're the same in the body, you're the same in the church. So I'm wrapping up here, guys. I know it's been 45 minutes, so my bad. So the liturgy means the work of the people, and it turns a bunch of me's into a single we, right? This is why the church practices, and this is why we believe in liturgical services, is because there's no me. It's a bunch of we's. All of us are coming together, and in partaking of this Eucharistic, at this Eucharistic table, it takes us away from this mindset of like, oh, what about me? What about me? Oh, my needs, my wants. It's like, no, it's about each other, and the church has embedded that everywhere. So, again... It's number one, we need to recognize how much we need each other. And that's embedded in the, in the environment. It's embedded in this idea that we have a differentiation of gifts and we need each other's gifts to be the fullness of who God created us to be. And number two, it's we live to serve one another. When we understand that the Trinity is unity and diversity, we're committed to living sacrifice, sacrificially in and for each other. We're committed to an irrevocable life of practical service and active compassion. Meaning, like, this is something that is, is so hard for us to grasp. But when the, when the Son took flesh and dwelt among us, he didn't look to the Father and be like, I don't want to do this. He, he sacri the, and the Father sacrificially gave the Son for us. He, and the Father gave his Son, the Son serves us, the Holy Spirit now lives in us. So the Trinity is working together in the same mission, the same will to save us, serving one another and serving you. How are we to serve one another? How much more are we to serve one another? How much more are we to encourage one another based on the model of what God did for us? And lastly, it's very important for us to recognize this, right? I heard one time from a bishop of the church, he says, your salvation is 100% dependent on your neighbor. And it's echoed by St. John Chrysostom. He says, I cannot believe that it's possible for a man to be saved if he does not labor for the salvation of his neighbor. This idea of unity and diversity, if you're not laboring for each other, if you're not serving one another, if you're not doing whatever you can to care for each other, we're missing the whole point of who God is. We say we believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but we're not modeling our life after them. And finally, we give each other the space to be different. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is portrayed, and this is the one that I want to just spend a few minutes on. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is portrayed as one who reached out to the other, deliberately going beyond his comfort zone to establish relationships with those who are radically different from him, both ethnically and culturally. You think about Jesus going to the Samaritan woman. Radical. You're thinking about letting the woman who was a sinner wash the feet of Je Jesus. Prostitute. Radi radical. You think about him defending a woman who was caught in adultery. Radical. Think about talking to um, uh, fishermen, talking to tax collectors. Jesus, time and time again, reaches out to people who are different than him. In, in, with the intent, what Jewish man talks to a Samaritan? What Jewish man talks to a Pharisee? What Jewish man talk, tells the story of the Good Samaritan? How dare you, Jesus? You're a Jew. How can you say, how can you say good things about a Samaritan? We're enemies. We're rivals. But 
this idea of unity and diversity encourages us to say, who is different than me? Can I have a relationship with somebody who doesn't believe what I believe? How are we to do evangelism? How are we to share the message of the gospel with, with, when all we do is surround ourselves with just people like us? How is the church ever to reach those who don't even know, have never even heard the message of love and the message of redemption of Christ if we don't invite people in? That's the premise. It's like unity and diversity is not just a cool catchphrase. It's, a, it's even the principle of how we do mission work. It's the mindset of like, man, I can't just have a bunch of people that look like me right next to me in church all the time. Surely the church is for all people of all nations, of all tribes, myriads of myriads, right? That's a song that we sing in church. Surely it's not just about having everybody like me next to me all the time. And that's why it's important in our works, in, in our workplaces, when we finally do go back to work. That's why it's important when, when we're interacting with others, that we don't surround ourselves with just people like us. Interact. I'm not saying, remember, we said this, unity without consuming or diluting, meaning this, I don't dilute myself to fit in. I don't dilute myself to want to be like everybody else. I still stay, remain, remain firm in who I am, but I, I meet a person where they are. I connect with a person where they are. And that's the principle of this whole conversation, right? Is that it's shaped by God, it's modeled in the church, and it's supposed to pour out into the world around us. Shaped by God, modeled in us, poured out into the world around us. Unfortunately, the world is bleeding into the church, and the church, and when I, don't, when I say the church, I don't mean the capital C church, I mean you and I, the church, is bleeding into the church, and that in return, is not pointing favorably back to God. And that's why Gandhi always says, I love your Christ, but I hate your Christians. Because your, your Christians don't look like Christ. So the glory of God, the glory of God is a living man. We only become a real person by actually, we only become alive by living for our neighbor, by caring for each other, by pointing all of the glory that we receive back to God and by encouraging each other to live to the fullness of who we ought to be. Justin Martyr, one of the early church fathers, writes a letter to one of his friends who had committed a grave sin. And he writes this letter saying to him, he says, the church is wounded and it can only be healed when you return. Imagine the heart of Justin Martyr. Imagine that mindset, that unity that he believed that the church was wounded and because his brother not being there, it would always remain wounded until he returned. I don't mean to be ending on a Debbie Downer note, but what I do encourage you guys to do, and I'm, I'm guilty of it first and foremost, is I encourage you guys to be thinking during this time period, how can I strive for more unity while respecting diversity? Fair? Any questions, comments? That was a long talk, 52 minutes. Well, no, I don't know if that was actually the whole length of the talk. That was, we started like 10 minutes in, right? So yeah, 43, no, it was, 43 minutes, 43 minutes. It doesn't matter, it was, it was great. It's great. I don't like to talk for more than usually 38 minutes, but that was longer. It's a lot of heavy stuff. Any questions? I have a comment. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, for this talk. I think it, it came at an amazing time when we're you know, celebrating the Apostles' Feast today. Um, and I think the Apostles themselves are a great example of what you were discussing today about, um, you know, like Paul was a Pharisee, Peter a fisherman, all these disciples and apostles coming from different backgrounds, and they're all... Um, I guess as much as they could align, you know, their wills aligned and, and God gave them that grace to, to spread the message. Um, but not only that, but when they were, you know, preaching to these, to these nations, they didn't tell the nations, you know, oh, you have to speak the Hebrew language or you have to do this and that. And even when those, you know, discussions came up like, oh, we have to circumcise everyone. Like they had a council about it, you know, and they were like, no, you don't have to do that. So I think if we model ourselves um, 
uh, you know, after we're the continuation, right? We're the continuation of acts. And, and so um, if we model ourselves uh, having that mindset that you described, you know, not diluting our faith, but um, accepting and promoting each other's, you know, diversity of gifts, we can really go a long way. So thanks a lot for that uh, Thank discussion. You. Thank you, Mina. I, I, I love that comment. That's a perfect comment for, especially like you said, on a day like this. Because there, there was actually a lot of diversity of, of, I was reading today, even the earliest, you know, followers of Christ were so multicultural, were so diverse in gifts, were so diverse in personalities, right? So, but they all had the same mission, same focus, the same goal. We all need to be having the same goal, which is to always point back to Christ. That is our, that is our wholeheartedly our purpose, Right. So whether we are podcasting, whether we're giving talks, whether we're healthcare workers, whether we're engineers, we, it doesn't matter what we do. It matters how we do it. Whatever we do, we do it for the glory of God. Whatever we do, we, we, we embody the professionalism and the, and the dignity of being a Christian. And from that dignity of being a Christian, it pours out into a, a, a respect and admiration that others will see through us that we, we will let our light so shine before men that they would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. That's the goal. That's the goal of unity and diversity. That's the goal of this whole talk is that everything that we do always points back to God.